Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, here today with another episode on Xbox and its pending, question mark, acquisition of gaming publisher Activision, which has been challenged by the Federal Trade Commission in the United States. Now, if you haven't been following this story since the very beginning, I can't blame you. That very beginning was more than a year ago, and seemingly every day has updates in this story and our longest playlist on the channel. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been able to update this playlist in about two months. For those of you that have been following the channel or the community posts, you know that I unfortunately had a stroke just after making this episode on Xmas Party, where we talked about the Microsoft and Activision answers to the Federal Trade Commission's challenge. Now, thanks to the wonderful therapists and care that I received after that stroke, I'm able to come back on just a few months later and talk you through some of the issues that I'm seeing. But... It's not going to be perfect, and in some ways this video is intended to be a bit of a test to see how my recovery is going and whether or not I can talk through these issues at length with you as we were doing on this playlist before my unfortunate medical incident. So if you will bear with me in some of my strange pronunciations and change in cadence, I would appreciate it, but I do apologize for those if and when they occur. Now before we get into the subject matter of this particular video, I do want to point out that this channel, like so many others, are supported by the viewers like you, like I'm a PBS telethon or something. We've got Utreon and Patreon if you're interested in supporting the channel, and on one of the tiers on those platforms, you can support an individual episode per month, as Lady Emily has done. Thank you so much, Lady Emily. You've been a constant support for the channel for a long, long time now. And I really, really appreciate it. Again, if you want to check out those tiers, you can at Utreon or Patreon. And many, many special thanks to Lady Emily. Now, before we get into what we're talking about today, which is that Sony, which has gotten involved in this, you might notice I didn't mention Sony at the top there, has gotten involved in this to try to stop the deal for their own benefit, as can be expected from businesses. There's no problem with that. They have now gotten involved a little bit more than they would like. And whether or not they're regretting their involvement is going to be an open question for everybody. But I wanted to point out the way this is being reported in a number of places. This is Games Industry Biz on your screen right now. that says, Microsoft granted access to Sony documents, the FTC's response in detail, and then they go over the judge's decision that went against Sony. And again, they refer to it as the FTC's response. So I thought there might be another response when I looked at this article. There is not. They're talking specifically about the document we're going to go over in this episode. Similarly, if we look at Video Games Chronicle, VGC, they refer to it as the Federal Trade Commission has largely denied Sony's request. And I think it's important to make a few distinctions here because otherwise this reporting is going to get real weird real soon. And that is that an adjudicative proceeding is occurring at the Federal Trade Commission with a judge that is an employee of the Federal Trade Commission, but that is supposed to be acting impartially. So these articles are going to get real weird when the judge starts to decide things against the FTC. Presumably the FTC will lose at least one motion somewhere along the line, and it'll be headlined, the Federal Trade Commission has denied the Federal Trade Commission's request or something like that. But I want to be clear, an adjudicative proceeding is done by a judge that is an employee in general of the agency that we're talking about here, the Federal Trade Commission, but they aren't really the Federal Trade Commission acting. So when you look at this as the Federal Trade Commission response, that's a little bit unclear in my opinion, as is the reference to the Federal Trade Commission denying Sony's request. This is a judge. You can think of this like a courtroom, even though it's not. And it's not an Article Three judge. It's not a judiciary member. It's a employee of this agency. It isn't acting as the FTC. The proceeding before it is the Federal Trade Commission versus Microsoft Activision Blizzard. And so there will be decisions that are made either on behalf of or against the Federal Trade Commission by this judge, ultimately. But you look at these documents, they look very much like court documents. And it isn't the Federal Trade Commission making this determination as much as it's the judge that is adjudicating this particular matter before the Federal Trade Commission. And that might seem like angels on the head of a pin, but I do think it's important to make those distinctions because without them, you are going to get real confused or have some real confusing articles in the very near future. Now, on this particular point, we have to talk about what's been happening in this case. So again, if you look at the playlist, we've covered a lot of this, but basically what has happened is that there's one vocal challenger to Microsoft purchasing Activision, and that is Sony and their PlayStation brand, which wants to see Call of Duty remain on their system. Now, Phil Spencer, Microsoft has promised that it will. They've offered 10-year deals. Sony isn't really interested in that. They shifted a little bit towards the end of this sequence of events at the end of last year to saying instead of this is just a big problem for us that we can't compete, we can't exist, we can't participate in gaming if Call of Duty is pulled from our system. Now I've talked about that at length in these earlier videos. You can check that out. I don't think it's 
a very good argument on their behalf, but they got involved. They gave the Federal Trade Commission and the CMA of Britain and the EU the ammunition they needed to potentially challenge the deal. And as a result, with Microsoft now facing this challenge before the Federal Trade Commission judge, they Microsoft had taken the opportunity to go and ask for additional information from Sony, believing that Sony's exclusivity patterns on their own were enough to make the entire question here pertinent to whether or not they should be allowed to purchase a company that makes video games because Sony itself makes a lot of games exclusive through contracts that they have with those parties. So Microsoft asked for this information from Sony. Sony tried to fight it. And you'll see all of this in the early words here of the order from the Federal Trade Commission judge. Order on motion of Sony Interactive Entertainment LLC to quash or limit subpoena Duce's Tecum. So basically a subpoena Duce's Tecum is a request to provide documentation rather than just testimony. And so this was a request from Microsoft to go get internal documents of Sony and Sony tried to quash or limit it, tried to kill it or make it smaller. And this is the judge's response to that request. On February 3rd, 2023, non-party Sony Interactive Entertainment LLC filed a motion to quash or to limit a subpoena Duce's Tecum served on SIE by respondent Microsoft Corp. On February 13th, 2023, 10 days later, Microsoft filed an opposition to the motion. For the reasons set forth below, Sony motion is granted in part and denied in part. Now that might seem like they won some and they lost some, and indeed they did in part, but for the most part, Sony lost pretty handily on their request to stop Microsoft from getting their internal documentation, as we will see in just a moment. So, the complaint in this matter alleges that Microsoft and Sony control the market for quote-unquote high-performance video game consoles, and that Microsoft's proposed acquisition of video game developer and publisher Activision Blizzard would give Microsoft the ability and incentive to withhold or degrade Activision's content in ways that substantially lessen competition in the alleged relevant markets. The complaint further alleges that Sony's gaming console, PlayStation, competes with Microsoft's gaming console, Xbox, and that the current generation of PlayStation and Xbox consoles are the only high-performance consoles presently available. On January 17, 2023, Microsoft served a subpoena on Sony containing 45 document requests, not a request for 45 documents, 45 separate categories of document that they wanted to see. On January 23rd, 2023, Sony provided written responses and objections to the subpoena. So six days later, Sony says, here are the reasons why we're not gonna comply with these requests. And maybe that was all of them. Maybe that was some of them. Sony and Microsoft met and conferred regarding Sony's objections on five occasions. So there's generally an obligation of various entities and parties involved in a litigation. And Sony's not a party to this litigation, but they're involved once the subpoena gets issued to them to go meet and confer, meaning that before you waste the court's time with an order and all these things, that you go try to negotiate whatever problems you have so that we can manage resources at the judiciary, or in this case, executive administrative law level. Sony and Microsoft met and conferred five occasions. The motion addresses the areas that remain in dispute, described more fully below. Microsoft argues that Sony's video game business is integral to complaint counsel's theory of anti-competitive harm in this case, and that Sony documents and data are central to the issues presented in this litigation. So Microsoft says, hey, look, Sony are the ones that are arguing that this deal isn't allowed. Their internal documents, how they see the world and how they handle themselves in the gaming industry are super important to being able to defend ourselves in front of the FTC. In general, Sony does not contest the relevance of the information sought, but resists discovery primarily on the ground that searching for and producing the disputed data and documents is unduly burdensome. And that's the magic phrase of the day, unduly burdensome. And that unduly is doing work. It can be burdensome. It can be hard to get all the information that Microsoft is asking for, but it has to be essentially unfairly so. Microsoft responds that Sony has failed to demonstrate that complying with the requested discovery presents any undue burden, particularly considering the relevance of Sony's video game business to this proceeding. Then we get kind of the state of the law as the judge sees it. Pursuant to rule 3.31C1 of the commission's rules of practice, Parties may obtain discovery, they can go and get this documentation, to the extent that it may be reasonably expected to yield information relevant to the allegations of the complaint, to the proposed relief, or to the defenses of any respondent. Remember, the FTC has moved to stop this deal on the premise that Microsoft having the power over Call of Duty would allow them to take undue market power to substantially restrict competition within various markets of gaming, not gaming on the whole, because that would be ridiculous, but these sub markets related to high performance consoles and cloud gaming and streaming and things like that. 
The administrative law judge may deny or restrict discovery in order to protect a party or other person from annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, or undue burden or expense, or to prevent undue delay in the proceeding. So you're supposed to be able to get all the documents that you want, even from a non-party, to the extent that might yield information relevant to the allegations of the complaint, but you aren't allowed to go and oppress someone or embarrass them or provide undue burdens on them. So if Microsoft had said, give us every piece of paper that has ever said the word video game for the last 25 years, that is unlikely to yield important information and it will be unduly burdensome because there's going to be so many pages that Sony would have to provide. A non-party seeking to quash or limit a subpoena has the burden of demonstrating why discovery should be denied or restricted. So when we think of burdens of proof, Microsoft is advantaged here that they go and ask for the information. If you try to stop it, if you're Sony, the burden is on you to say why this should be quashed, why this should be stopped, because we want more information, more information, generally a good thing. A general allegation by the non-party that a subpoena is unduly burdensome is insufficient to carry that burden of showing that the request of discovery should be denied. So they can't just file a piece of paper that says, this is really unfair, your honor. You have to explain why it's unfair. Moreover, even where a subpoenaed third party adequately demonstrates the compliance with the subpoena will impose a substantial degree of burden, inconvenience, and cost, that will not excuse producing information that appears generally relevant to the issues in the proceeding. Said another way, unduly burdensome has the word unduly in it for a reason. We don't care if it's burdensome. We care if it is unduly burdensome. Sony seeks an order limiting the custodians whose records are to be searched for responsive materials. Custodians here being not the janitors at Sony, but the keepers of the records there. Limiting the date range for responsive documents, which is the one area where they will win. Quashing enumerated document requests and quashing or limiting the subpoena generally. So they're gonna lose this last one pretty hard. They're gonna win on some of the stuff with enumerated document requests. Specific requests are not gonna be allowed. So first, we have a request to limit custodians, Lin Tao and Hideki Nishino. Sony opposes including Lin Tao and Hideki Nishino as custodians whose files should be searched for documents responsive to the subpoena. Sony does not, as to either requested custodian, contend that the custodian's files are irrelevant. That's going to be a continuing pattern that we see in this document. Sony does not really fight that this information might be useful to Microsoft. And that's going to put them in the negative space as they start with this judge, because if it is relevant, generally speaking, we want to see relevant information. As to Tao, Sony asserts that a high percentage of Tao's files are in Japanese, which Sony argues would render searching Tao's files more time-consuming and expensive. Now, interestingly, of course, Sony is a Japanese company. I know they're headquartered here now, but historically, and with many of their personnel, operations occur in Japan. However, the declaration upon which Sony relies in its motion does not quantify a cost or establish the extent of Japanese language files. Stating that, I also understand a custodian collection of documents in this matter could involve review of Japanese language files. Nor does Sony persuasively explain why searching for and producing Tao's files presents an undue burden to Sony. Accordingly, Sony's attempt to resist discovery as to Tao on the basis of undue burden is rejected. Sony's motion fails to include arguments as to why discovery of the files of Nishino should be denied. It's claimed that it was Sony's understanding that Microsoft had dropped its demand for Nishino's files and that Microsoft had not mentioned Nishino in some time is not legally dispositive. So this is another thing that's going to be underpinning Sony's action. There were those meets and conferences with Microsoft that were talked about up above in this document that Sony is trying to rely upon as if Microsoft had promised them something. And so they put forth their motion to quash with things like, hey, they didn't ask for Nishino stuff for a while and they hadn't mentioned him. So we don't think that this should be something that they can request in this document. As the judge says, that's not legally dispositive. The issue on a motion to quash is not what the parties might have agreed to in the spirit of compromise in order to avoid judicial re resolution of a dispute, but whether the party resisting discovery has met its burden of establishing why discovery should be disallowed. As to Nishino, Sony has failed to meet this burden. Accordingly, Sony's request to exclude Tao and Nishino as custodians is rejected, so they're going to have to provide the documentation from these two custodians of their records. Then we look at predecessor custodians. The relevant time period under the subpoena for the custodial record searches is January 1st, 2019 to present. So just about four years. For those custodians who took their positions at Sony after that date, Sony seeks to limit the time period for the record search to the period of time since the custodian took the position and dispense with any obligation to search the records of those who held the position previously. That is, the predecessor custodians. As grounds for this limitation, Sony argues that it is sufficient to search the records of the present custodian's direct supervisor because the documents would overlap with those of the predecessor custodian. The implication that responsive documents in the possession of a predecessor custodian would necessarily also be in the possession of that custodian's direct supervisor is speculative and unpersuasive. 
Accordingly, Sony's request to limit the scope of the custodial searches requested is rejected. So basically, Microsoft went and asked for the records of all these custodians from January 1st, 2019 to the present. Sony says, well, some of the people have only been hired after 2020, and we don't want to go back to people that have left our employ. So we'll just assume that the documents that would have been with those custodians have been gone up to their su supervisors because that's the way we would like them to conduct business. Judge says, well, that's great, but you don't have any reason to believe that all the documents that could refer to things that are important to this particular legal action made their way to the direct supervisors. So we're going to grant Microsoft's request to get all this information wherever it was found. Then we talk about Greg McCurdy, who is a lawyer. Greg McCurdy is identified as Sony's in-house antitrust lawyer. Microsoft contends that in this role, McCurdy has interacted with regulators, legislative staff, consultants, and other third parties regarding the challenged acquisition of Activision and that such external communications are relevant and not privileged. Now, in-house counsel have an interesting role. Uh, if you don't know attorney-client privilege, the basics are that an attorney advises a client and cannot be made to divulge what that advice was or the documentation related to that advice without the client's consent. But in-house counsel is both a lawyer to the client that is the company that employs them and in this role as described by microsoft a kind of communications professional with those parties that where they act as sony and not as in-house counsel microsoft has limited its request to mccurdy's communications with external entities only so microsoft is not trying to get communications that mccurdy might have had with say the president of playstation or the president of sony or internal people that are not presidents because those would generally be privileged if the content of those conversations related to legal advice. Here, they're saying, look, he acted as Sony. They were going out and talking to legislative staff, consultants, third parties. We want those pieces of information. Sony maintains that McCurdy has no business role and that even if his communications with external entities were relevant, communications with external counsel and public affairs professionals were for the purpose of seeking or obtaining legal advice and are therefore privileged. Some of that might be true. If McCurdy was going and asking some kind of legal body for advice on what they were thinking about regulations or statutes or anything else, that would be the kind of thing where he's acting as Sony in client role to another outside counsel. So he's in-house counsel, but as a, for instance, Hoglaw represents a number of companies that have in-house counsel where I talk with their lawyers and that advice that I give would be privileged because I'm outside counsel giving legal advice to a company, even if it is their in-house counsel. Sony says that's all he ever did. Sony further argues that it would be unduly burdensome to require a search of McCurdy's files for potentially very few relevant and non-privileged documents, and that the types of communications that Microsoft seeks will be obtained through searches of the files of the custodians, which Microsoft and Sony have agreed are relevant. The judge points out that in-house counsel are not immune from discovery merely by virtue of their role as lawyers, nor does Sony contend otherwise. Rather, Sony contends that the burden of searching for responsive documents is too great because it is likely that such search will yield few non-privileged documents and that any non-privileged documents discovered are quote-unquote unlikely to be relevant. Sony's assertions are conclusory and unsupported. So you can see the judge is leaning away from Sony on a lot of these. Microsoft has narrowed the request to external communications only and has limited the time period to the approximately eight months in which McCurdy has been in his role. Accordingly, Sony's request to exclude McCur McCurdy as a custodian is rejected. So the judges basically decided for Microsoft on each of these first three issues. We'll see Sony's big win with respect to the date range here, but it's a limited win at best. Instruction two of the subpoena specifications provides that unless a document request otherwise specifies, the applicable time period for responsive documents commence on January 1st, 2019. So unless there's another agreement, January 1st, 2019 is the applicable period in which we're going to be looking at documents and then we're going to have things that are allowed. Sony objects to requests in a bunch of these different paragraphs to the extent they specify a time period commencing in 2012. So Microsoft asked for 10 years of data, but the baseline rule that was already put forth in the subpoena was about four years of data. Sony requests that these document requests be limited to the subpoena's generally applicable time period commencing in 2019. Sony argues that documents reaching back a decade are minimally relevant to this action which is focused on the likelihood of future anti-competitive effects from the challenged acquisition, and then imposing a burden on Sony to search for and produce documents going back to 2012 is unjustified. Microsoft counters that the foregoing requests should not be quashed, but does not address why these requests should be not time-limited as requested by Sony. Microsoft does not address why the requests should not be governed by the generally applicable time period commencing in 2019, or otherwise explain why these document requests require application of an extended time period. Requiring Sony to conduct a document search and produce documents going back 10 years appears on its face to be excessive, especially where, as here, 
The issues in the case do not center on past conduct, but the alleged likelihood of anti-competitive effects in the future. Sony's request to limit the applicable time period for requests of these paragraphs to begin in January 1st, 2019 is granted. Said another way, Microsoft has a baseline of 2019, asked for longer periods for a number of these paragraphs, and the judge said, nope, 2019 is fine for these things because we're looking at forward looking effects and a decade back isn't important. Now, Microsoft wants a lot of this stuff going a decade back because they're going to try to establish to the FTC and to the judge that Sony has been engaged in exclusivity strategies for a long, long time, but they're going to have to do it only in the last four years. Request to quash specified document requests include request number three, where Sony is asked to produce all drafts of and communications regarding SIE's president and CEO Jim Ryan's declaration titled SIE Declaration to FTC on Microsoft Activision Blizzard Transaction dated December 5th, 2022. Sony states that there only that there are no privileged doc, uh, no non-privileged documents responsive to this request beyond Sony's communication to the FTC attaching the signed declaration, which Microsoft already has. So Sony's main argument here is Microsoft wants to know what other drafts and notes might have been made on this statement because this is where Sony really went hog and said, we can't survive if we don't get Call of Duty. And they want to know exactly how this came to be. Sony basically says everything is privileged related to this thing, implying that legal wrote it and then revised it. FTC Rule 338A, however, requires that any person withholding material responsive to a subpoena based on a claim of privilege shall, if so directed in the subpoena, submit together with such a claim a schedule which describes the nature of the documents, communications, or tangible things not produced or disclosed, and does so in a manner that, without revealing information itself privileged or protected, will enable other parties to assess the claim. Right? So you can't just declare, like Michael Scott in the office, bankruptcy. You can't just declare privilege and everybody has, has to put their heads down and say, oh, okay, it's privilege. FTC Rule 338A says what you have to do is you have to tell us why it's privileged. Now, I've said this implies that legal wrote it. Sony has to actually tell us that. We can't do a legal process by implication. A person withholding materials for reason and privilege, as described in this section, shall comply with the requirements of that subsection in lieu of filing a motion to limit or quash compulsory process. Based on the foregoing, Sony has failed to demonstrate the request three should be quashed and the request is rejected. So, so Sony didn't want to do its homework or is fibbing a little bit. And here, the judge says, you're going to have to do that homework if you want to block this particular request. As to request 13, Sony was asked to deliver documents related to performance reviews or evaluations of Sony's CEO, as well as the employee's direct reports or other related leadership or management. Now, on its face, that does seem like a request that isn't immediately, understandably related to the action in question, right? Why exactly would Microsoft need to see the employee reviews of Jim Ryan or anybody else, right? Microsoft contends the materials, however, are relevant to understanding the metrics on which Sony's executives and businesses are evaluated. And then you start to see at least a little bit about what Microsoft is thinking here. We want to know if Jim Ryan gets a 15% bonus if he signs 50 exclusivity agreements, right? The judge doesn't agree, however. This agreement is, this argument is unpersuasive. This is not an employment case and the metrics by which employees are evaluated have no apparent logical connection to the allegations of the complaint. The proposed relief or to the defenses of any respondent. Microsoft asserts that it has agreed to limit request 13 to performance reviews or evaluations that are otherwise responsive to the subpoena, but this pro-offered limitation is too vague and overbroad to serve as a meaningful way to limit the production of relevant information. Moreover, employees have a privacy interest in maintaining the confidentiality of their personnel files. For the above reasons, Sony's request to quash request 13 is granted. So Sony is not gonna have to deliver Jim Ryan's performance reviews to Microsoft, which Makes a lot of sense, I think. I think the judge is pretty much on the ball here with these requests. Although I think Microsoft could have done a better job of saying what we really want to know if there are metrics related to exclusivity or market share or things that are related to antitrust concerns rather than responsive to the subpoena. Because I agree with the judge, that isn't very useful in terms of legal language. As to request 35, Sony seeks to quash it which asks Sony to produce an executed copy of every content licensing agreement you have entered into with any third-party publisher between January 1st, 2012 and present. Now, that's already been modified to January 1st, 2019, as we saw. Sony argues that such information has no apparent probative value. It isn't useful to understanding the marketplace or that Microsoft might use to defend itself. Sony further asserts that Sony's system does not enable Sony to search for contracts by company type, 
and instead requires a search by company name. Therefore, according to Sony, compiling the contract documents responsive to the request would require a manual review of over 150,000 contract records with roughly 60,000 companies across various databases. Now, that's an interesting assertion that we can't look for contracts by contract type. Now, I will tell you, first and foremost, that there are document filing systems, including ones used by my firm, that allow you to put in information when the document is created about what it is that you just created. Is it a purchase agreement? Is it a licensing agreement? All sorts of things that lawyers do all the time in order to be able to search for things, including precedent in their own files, when taking on a new task. Now, Sony apparently doesn't have that, which is fine. We're assuming that Sony isn't lying to the administrative law judge because that would be a bad idea. But if they don't have it, as my wife would say, that sounds like a you problem more than a me problem. Okay, you didn't bother to file your documents in a way that is easily searchable, even though you're a multinational corporation that is likely to get into many lawsuits. You might be trying to avoid requests like this by not having such a filing system, but we're not going to let you do that because we're not going to incentivize you just not filing your documents in a very useful way. Microsoft argues that the complaint in this case makes a number of allegations regarding high-performance video game console developers' exclusivity arrangements with video game publishers. Microsoft states that it is aware that Sony requires many third-party publishers to agree to exclusivity provisions, including preventing the publishers from putting their games on Xbox multi-game subscription service, Game Pass, and that understanding the full extent of Sony's exclusivity arrangements and their effect on the industry's competitiveness will assist in its defense. Microsoft further contends that Sony's 150,000 figure represents all of its contracts, not just content licensing agreements, and that Sony presumably is aware of the names of the companies with which it has content licensing agreements and can therefore create keyword searches, searches to isolate the relevant contracts. <laughs> I like this presumably. As characterized by the judge, Microsoft's argument is, hey, okay, Sony presumably knows who it's entered into business with, so hopefully we can get through this together and we can figure out exactly what those content licensing agreements look like. The judge agrees with Microsoft. The nature and extent of Sony's content licensing agreements are relevant to the complaints allegations of exclusivity agreements between video game console developers and video game developers and publishers. In addition, the alleged burden of having to review an excessive volume of contracts is materially decreased because as held above, the applicable date range will be limited to January 1st, 2019 to the present. So removal of that date range down from 2012 to 2019 is also helpful to say, well, that's got to be a substantial reduction in your 150,000 contracts, right? Moreover, it is logical to assume that Sony can determine the names of those companies with which it has content licensing contracts and frame its digital record search accordingly to minimize the need for a manual search of all its contract records. Based on the foregoing, Sony's request to quash request 35 is rejected. And it looks like Sony is taking the same kind of tech that we saw both with the FTC directly and in general in their public comments, which is just very, very aggressive. No, we're not going to deliver content licensing agreements because they have no probative value. Sony can't possibly believe that. This entire case is related to what exclusivity means and how the gaming industry works. And Microsoft wants to be able to point to the number of exclusivity agreements that we know Sony has, whether just for content and something like Hogwarts Legacy or for whole games of various types, and say, this is the model on which our industry operates. So if you're going to take the step to block a deal based on making, it, making their products exclusive, you better really think about it, FTC, because there's a whole lot of stuff going on with contracts that don't require you to even merge with anybody or acquire them. And Sony's got to be worried about that, which is one of the reasons I framed this particular video as Sony's regret. As we go further and further on this, you do have to wonder whether Sony is ultimately going to be happy with the end result, even if they get the Microsoft Activision deal blocked. Because one of the things that's going to happen with these documents, which should be held under seal by the Federal Trade Commission, is that some of this information is going to leak out, and some of what Sony is doing is going to leak out. And... Sony is being framed right now by these various regulators as participating in a two-party market, right? One of the big fights is that a lot of these regulators have decided that Nintendo is not in the market that they're looking at because they're not a high-performance console, but that makes it a two-party market in which Sony is the vast, vast market share leader over Microsoft, and you've got all of these parties at regulators and in various places that are going to be looking at what Sony is doing very carefully. And so at the end of all this, you are going to have to ask if you're Sony or Sony's executives whether it was all worth it to block this particular deal. If they do, in fact, block it. If they don't block it, it's the worst of all worlds. They're going to have this information out there. It's going to be in the hands of their leading competitor. We're going to see some bits and pieces of it. We're probably not going to see numbers. We're probably not going to see everything that many of you might want to see in this space. But we're going to see some of it. And Sony may or may not be able to block the deal with the Federal Trade Commission.
Sony requests an order limiting the definitions in the subpoena and various unspecified individual document requests in accordance with the submittal attached to the motion and identified as Exhibit H. Sony fails to include any particular particulars, examples, or legal arguments. Moreover, Sony's Exhibit H is not itself legal argument or an explanation for quashing or limiting any definition or document request, but rather appears to be a document setting forth Sony's understanding of various agreements made by Sony and Microsoft in the course of negotiating Sony's objections to the subpoena. So Sony has put forth an umbrella complaint that basically says Microsoft agreed to not do this and then they did it anyway. That is not something that a court or an administrative law judge has to listen to. I don't care what you guys decide in the conference room somewhere. This is what Microsoft went out with. You have a reason why the, the court, or in this case, the administrative law judge, should not grant the ability to subpoena these documents. And just like above, this is going to fail. Based on the foregoing, the motion is granted in part and denied in part, as we saw above. Sony's request to limit custodians is denied. Sony's request to limit document requests is granted up through January 1st, 2019. Sony's request to quash document request 3 is denied. 13 is granted. 35 is denied. Sony's request to quash or limit the subpoena based on just this umbrella terminology in Exhibit H is denied. So while it looks about half and half in the actual listing here, Microsoft has the big win. They're going to get access to Sony's internal documents. Sony's exclusivity arrangements are going to be reviewed as well as their commercial terms of those documents, which Microsoft is going to be very interested in. And Sony did this effectively by arguing against the deal in no uncertain terms to the Federal Trade Commission itself. Now, the fact that they then went and told the Federal Trade Commission judge here that things like their content licensing agreements were not probative to the action are, I would say, disingenuous, if I'm being generous. But that's the state of play. And that's how you get headlines like, Federal Trade Commission has largely denied Sony's request, even though the number of paragraphs are pretty even. So at the end of the day, that's the state of things right now. And you do have to wonder whether Sony's happy with how things are going and how they think they think they might be going in the future. That's all amidst the Federal Trade Commission that is in tumult after having lost the Facebook within case that we've put forth in this playlist as the Federal Trade Commission going absolutely nuts. So that's already been done. So the Federal Trade Commission is not having a great track record with how it's operating under Chair Lena Khan, and we'll see how they proceed in the future. Now, will there be a change in the Federal Trade Commission's thought process if things continue to go against them? Perhaps. People have asked me whether the European Union or the CMA might change how the FTC is going to operate. The answer is I don't know. These are just people, right? All these agencies, which we give these highfalutin concepts to and put flags and emblems around, are just people making decisions. So Lena Khan has made a certain number of decisions. They haven't all gone well for her since she took over the chairpersonship of the Federal Trade Commission. Does the EU doing something different or the CMA potentially doing something different change the FTC stripes? I don't know. Nobody can tell you that. You got a lot of people talking in various places in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere that have their own thoughts about what might happen. And yes, it's possible the FTC could change if all the other regulators went a different direction, but that's basically guessing as to kind of human choice and psychology. And that's not really what lawyers do. So unfortunately, I can't give you any guarantees there. I still think this is likely to go through with reasonable concessions for licensing of products like Call of Duty, potentially. But I don't think that we have any guarantees for the next several months about what's going to happen from here on out. As I said before, this channel is supported by viewers and subscribers like you. Check out our Utreon and our Patreon if you're interested. We've got links in the description below. And thank you so much to Lady Emily for supporting this channel for so long. Again, I appreciate it. But if you don't want to use either of those platforms, just subscribe and tell your friends. That's the best way to support the channel. And for everybody that's been supporting me throughout all the things that have happened over the last two months, I'm so, so thankful. I guess we passed the test of getting to the end here. Obviously, it's a lot trickier to speak at this length of time right now for me, but hopefully with a little bit more recovery, a little bit more rehab, I can continue to get stronger and have even better speech. If you can believe it, my language was really messed up right after the stroke, and this is me much stronger than it was in its immediate aftermath. So I really appreciate you hanging out with me for the length of this video, and thank you so much. If you're interested in more videos, check out the playlist, Microsoft Times Activision, or elsewhere on the channel for more. Thanks so much and have a great day.